This nightmare began a little over two years ago. I was divorced a year earlier and found myself online looking for what I wasn't totally sure. I was 59 at the time, and for the first time in a long time, I was on my own and I felt lonely. I wasn't internet savvy. I knew how to email, I had Facebook to keep in touch with my adult daughters, but the extent of my knowledge was just that, very basic. A friend of mine talked to me one day and she mentioned that maybe I should start dating again, maybe casually, just to get out of the house, rather than going to work and coming home. I laughed at the idea, but then pondered it before searching online for dating sites and joined Our Time. I figured it would be safe, as it's targeted for older people, and I would have a better shot at finding a man who is my age. I admit, I was fearful of joining dating sites that are targeted for younger people. I didn't want to get gross, X-rated photos and X-rated stuff. I wanted quality conversation with an adult man. I joined one night just on a whim, uploaded a picture, put in my details and waited. I had paid for a month of membership so I could message anyone who might be interested. I also figured it was safer because only serious guys would pay for a membership. About a week, and I would get flirt hearts and things like that, which meant people who sent the hearts either didn't have a paid membership so they couldn't message me, but I browsed, I sent some flirts and a few messages, quick chats, and there were a few guys who lived in my area, but it was nothing worth diving into. No one really piqued my interest. I was going to cancel my membership at the end of the month, and I didn't feel any success was had. I had one week left on my paid membership when I met Michael. He had sent me a flirt heart, and I responded. I was then met with a message. He was a paying member. He introduced himself as Michael Futelli. He said he was on here looking for a serious relationship and that he had not found anyone interesting. He came across my profile and found me to be beautiful. I was a bit taken back by it. I looked over his pics, and he was quite handsome. He was five years older than me and said he had worked as a contractor for various oil drilling companies. His location said he lived two hours away from my town, which was okay and close enough if we had decided to meet for dinner. As we chatted, I let him know I didn't plan on staying on the paid membership on our time. I hadn't found the site as fun as I thought it would be, and he actually agreed with me and said he was leaving the site because he had not found anyone in his words that were God-fearing, loving, and serious-minded as a woman. He said all women on here just wanted sex or his money. I laughed to myself and told him I certainly don't want his money, and it wasn't after sex. I was set in my ways, and I wanted a nice man to share my life with, to travel together, take cruises, which was a passion of mine, and just enjoy our later years together. I wasn't out for playing games or casual. He said he felt like God had brought me to him, and he was about to give up. He gave me his email and phone number and asked for mine. He asked if I had WhatsApp, which I'd never heard of, but he told me he uses WhatsApp all the time and he gave me instructions on how to download it. We connected on WhatsApp and spent a few hours texting. He told me about his oil contracts, his daughter in college in the UK. I have two daughters, one in college in Florida, and my other daughter lives up the road from me. He questioned me on how often my daughter visits, which I found odd and I told him that she visits all the time. He got a bit defensive and said I should have my privacy in my own life and let my daughters live her life as they are grown. Okay, so that was one strike. I'm really close with my daughters. But I was able to see past it and get to know him more. When I asked him about meeting up for a lunch date, he surprised me by saying he was working in Malaysia right now, at the moment, for an oil contract. But he will be home, and the city that he was in matched his out our time profile. I asked him how long he would be away, and he said four months, then return for his contract, but he persuaded me that we could get to know each other better online before meeting in person anyways. Honestly, I wasn't in a hurry to jump into a relationship, so I thought, yes, it would be nice to get to know each other personally on a mental level, and then we could meet in the future. It sounded great. We started talking more and more via text. I worked days, so after work and late into the evening, Michael would pop on WhatsApp. We shared our lives. His wife had died of breast cancer, and he raised his daughter on his own with the help of a nanny, and then sent her away to college in the UK. He was family-orientated like me. He loved his daughter, but also at the time in his life where his daughter was growing up on her own and starting her own life in school. 
and like mine he finds himself longing for a mate as his child is now out of the house. It was almost too perfect. He wanted the same things. He said he loved travel. He wanted to take a cruise with me. He said he'd been all over the world and even sent me pictures of his office in Malaysia and photos of the places in Malaysia near his work and office. Pictures of food. Pictures of his apartment in Malaysia. I had been to Singapore once many, many years ago on vacation, so we talked about the differences in both countries. He was very knowledgeable about Malaysia. My nights were spent talking, and one night he called me on WhatsApp. I have to admit, after nights and nights of texting and looking at photos of him, photos of his apartment, and hearing his life story, his voice was not quite what I thought. He said he was born and raised in Italy. His mother was originally from Switzerland, and his father was from Italy, so he grew up in Italy. Now, I've really never spoken to anyone who was from Italy directly, but the accent just sounded off. When I asked him to say something in Italian to me, he said he didn't want to because he had bad memories of Italy. He said his father was very abusive to him, and he ended up moving back to Switzerland with his mother. He then said she passed, and he came to the States to live with his uncle, who was also originally from Switzerland. He said his uncle had been a missionary in Africa and taught him the lifestyle of Africa. When I asked him which country in Africa, he just said Africa. He got defensive with my question, and I didn't want to push him, so I left it alone. We started talking on the phone nightly. He would sing me love songs. Yes, he would sing to me, and he would send me good morning and good night texts. He asked me about my desires, my dreams. We talked every single night. He never missed a night, and he never missed a text. He would tell me about his business plans and go into great detail. As things moved forward, I told him I was excited for us to meet. He said he looked forward to it too, and he looked forward to giving me a kiss and a hug, and we even talked about holding on to each other. Nothing sex-related, just cuddling, what really, really mattered to me. By this point, I was falling in love. He would text and say he was sipping a cup of coffee and then send me a photo of himself, or who I thought was him, drinking a cup of coffee. I tried several times to video chat, and he said the connection was very poor in Malaysia. One afternoon, he called me on video from his office. He was sitting at his desk and waving to me. He said hello and would wave, but the video was grainy and very poor. I understood, though, due to his work and his location, maybe the video wouldn't come in clear, but at least he did video chat. At least I thought it was him. I was okay with voice chats and texting. I was worried I wasn't pretty and youthful enough so video chatting, or lack thereof, was okay with me. After all, we would meet soon, and this was deeper for me just to talk. He told me that he had some issues with work. He had a big project he was working on worth millions, and he had shown me his account. I was impressed with how he put a handle on his business. He seemed very educated, very wealthy, speaking about his work in great details. One evening, he told me that his client on another project tried to pay him, and the bank was not working for him due to him being out of the country. He said he needed to cash the check his client sent so that he could pay for other upcoming projects. He asked me if I would be willing to deposit the check in my account and then wire the money to his project manager's account in Malaysia. I was hesitant at first. Looking back, I didn't think it was a scammer because scammers don't ask. They ask for money. They don't send it, right? I was so wrong. I told him, sure, I would do it. He said his client would be mailing me two cashier's checks. I gave him my address. He told me he would let me know when they were mailed. I was to deposit them and then send via bank transfer to his project manager's account in Malaysia. It took about a week before I got two envelopes in my regular mail from the state of Minnesota. I checked the name and it was a lady's name on the return address label. I took the checks to the bank, and they deposited them. The teller at the bank said they are valid checks, and they checked them prior to depositing, and they held them. When asked by the teller if I knew who they were from, I did tell a little lie and say yes, it was my husband's business partner. Now this was my fault, but Michael told me to speed up the cashing of the checks. He said for me to lie and tell the teller that I knew who the checks came from, and I did. The checks cleared, and I let Michael know. He ended up having me wire the money via online banking to some man's bank account in Malaysia. The amounts were $1,500 and another for $1,000, two separate transactions. We continued our online romance. 
Long chats. We talked about being together and how he couldn't wait to come home and meet me. He said he loved me over and over, and really, I was falling in love with him. Or at least the idea of what he told me he wanted. I told Michael I was going to tell my one daughter about him, the one who lived close to me. Michael became very upset with me. He said, we should meet first, and he will meet my daughter in person, and would rather meet in person than to have her know about him prior. Him and I got into an argument about this, actually. Our first real fight. I told him I share everything with my daughters, and he made me feel bad and guilty about wanting to tell her about him. Michael said it was our relationship and not her business, as we are adults and she is an adult, and it's none of her business who her mother dates. I gave up my fight and just let him say his piece, and we moved forward from it. He started to lavish me with loving words and songs. Then a few days later, he sent me flowers to my house. I was totally shocked. I had never gotten flowers in all the years I was married. He apologized for hurting my feelings when it came to my daughter. I accepted, and we continued with our relationship. The next evening, I got home from work, checked my mail, and found five more checks from different people in different states. One had a return address, one had no return address, but it was stamped Bristol, Connecticut. I opened the envelopes, and enclosed were money orders, checks, cashier's checks, and various amounts, which totaled close to $4,000. I messaged Michael and asked him what was going on. One envelope had a post-it note on it that said, I love you, David. I hope this helps your son. I asked Michael what this was about and what the note was about. He didn't answer me right away, but then he replied to me three hours later. He said his clients for the new pipeline project were told my project manager to send the payments to you. He said it was a mix-up, and he asked if I could just cash the checks and forward them to his project manager's account in Malaysia, and he would make sure this never happened again. I was annoyed, but again, I was loving this man, so I told him I would deposit them tomorrow and then forward the money as soon as they cleared. When I asked him who David is and the post-it note in one of the envelopes, he said the note was probably stuck to a money order by accident and meant for his colleague's son who was sick. I kind of accepted this and it sounded logical. After all, I accidentally mailed my grocery list to the power company on a post-it note that got stuck to the bill. I mean, it could happen. I did as he told me and sent the money after the checks were deposited and cleared. There was no issue with the checks. They all cleared the bank, and Michael told me he would be delayed in coming home another month because of some issues with his contract. While I couldn't wait to see him, I understood and was glad because I was dieting and trying to lose some weight and tone up before we meet. I was so worried about what he would think of me in person that I hardly seen the red flags that were in front of me. I told him it was okay and we can meet next month. He asked me if we could go on a cruise together, and I was excited about that idea. I love cruises. He sent me a bunch of cruise package websites and told me, plan for our trip. I'll pay for everything. I felt loved, appreciated, and now he wanted to take a cruise with me. My ex-husband never wanted to go on cruises. A few days after he sent me the cruise websites, I ended up getting a delivery in the mail of more roses, some chocolates, and a teddy bear with a note that said he was thinking of me. I was so surprised and happy. Then, a few days after that, I got a beautiful set of earrings in the mail from him. The note said, with love, from Michael, wear these on our cruise. As you can guess, by this time I was over the moon with happiness. I was totally in love. Then, Michael messaged me that night and was very upset. I asked him what was going on, and he said he was having issues with his account still, and his daughter's birthday was on Friday, and he wanted to get her a gift. He said... He tried to get money from his project manager's account, but that money was for the project only, and he couldn't use it for anything else. I felt bad for him, and he called me crying. He said he just wanted to maybe get his daughter a $100 iTunes gift card or maybe an Amazon gift card. He asked me if I'd be able to buy one for her, give him a picture of the back of the card with the number scratched off, and he could give it to his daughter. I told him, sure. I mean, after all, what he's, he's all done for me. He got me flowers and all these great gifts. So... I got him an iTunes card, took a pic of the back, and sent it to him. Michael then asked me if it would be okay with doing more deposits for him and if people could wire my account money from clients. I told him of course it would be fine. I knew how frustrated he was. And as the days went on, my account got busy. Money in. I transferred it out. One night though, my account got hit with a $58,000 deposit from a person's account at a bank out of Japan. My mouth flew open. I repeatedly called Michael over and over with no answer. I was unable to contact him and I didn't know what to do. 
I ended up going to the bank and letting them know what was going on. The bank manager took me to his office so we could sort this, this out. I explained everything, and he said he was afraid I might be the victim of fraud. They put a freeze on the account and allowed the fraud investigator team to take over. I was unable to use my account. The $58,000 was rejected and sent back to the person who sent it. The only thing I saw on my deposit was a wire transfer from an account in Dubai. The other information wasn't given to me. The bank manager asked if I knew anyone in Dubai, and I told him no, absolutely not. I went home frustrated, scared, and angry. The bank manager called me later that day and let me know he will be closing out my account and I wouldn't be allowed to open another account with their bank. I was, however, able to get my money out from my work paychecks, so I was at least able to get my hard-earned money out to pay my bills before the account was closed. When I met for the second time with the bank manager, he let me know that several deposits made into my account were flagged by the bank account owners for fraud. My head was spinning, and I was afraid I was going to jail. The bank manager encouraged me to file a police report, which I did after leaving the bank. The police did very little other than telling me I was a victim of fraud, encouraged me to stop contact with Michael, and I would be lucky if I got out of this without bank fraud charges. However, seeing I was a victim, the police said it would be very unlikely I'd be charged, but they encouraged me to freeze my credit as well. I forgot to mention, Michael did have a copy of my driver's license because he said he was going to book a cruise and needed it to book my portion of the cruise. I was spinning with sickness. What was going on? Could it have been a mistake? I called Michael, but no response. Finally, he called me late that night. I was exhausted by this time. I told Michael what happened. He said he had no idea what was going on. He became angry with me that I was unable to pull the $58,000 out of my account. He said that was for his pipeline investment, and he wanted me to go to the bank and demand the money. I told him the bank closed my account, but he wanted me to go to the bank right now. I let him know it's 11 p.m. at night. The bank is closed. He said I ruined his project and his life, and his project manager will fire him, and he will lose everything, and it'll be all my fault. I was in tears. He was screaming at me. He called me names. He said I was stupid, useless, and that I disobeyed him by not telling him I was going to the bank. I was shocked. He was not the same man who was sweet-talking. I didn't know what to do. I was crying more, and he told me I was stupid again and again before hanging up and blocking me completely from WhatsApp. I tried calling him back, but it didn't work. I was blocked. I was drained. I was screaming, crying, upset, shaking. All this love and all these words were for nothing? To talk to me like that over money? I slept on it. I cried myself to sleep. I called in sick to work for two days, and then I became angry. And I decided, I'm going to play detective. I kept the envelopes of the people who sent me checks and money orders. I did a search which didn't lead me to much online until one woman I found via her social media, so I decided to send her a message and ask if she knew Michael. What she responded with shocked me. She said that she was talking to a man named David, and she had met him on Facebook and they were in a relationship together. She said David was working in the UK and his son James had become sick and the nanny needed money to pay for emergency surgery for James. She said this David gave her my name and said I was the nanny for his son James. We compared pictures and it was the same photo of Michael. She also shared with me she had sent money to Malaysia to a bank account there, the same account that I had sent money to as the project manager. And she said the account was for a project account but not for an oil rig. The scammer had been using both of us and telling us different stories. I guess the scammer had a network of women he used, told stories and more. I ended up becoming friends with this woman, and she blocked David, a.k.a. Michael, and whatever else name he used. I was able to find a couple more people I'd gotten money from, but most did not respond, and one woman actually messaged me back and told me to leave her man alone. I think I opened a can of worms I didn't want. Long story to make it shorter, my bank never charged me with any fees or anything, and law enforcement never charged me. I was very lucky, and I knew this. I tried my best to move forward, but a big part of me wonders who the person was that I talked to. What did they look like? Where were they from? And who was this man that I shared everything with? I guess I'll never know, but I've had to learn to close my heart down and my social media life, and I no longer go on dating sites. If I meet a man, I'll meet him in person. 
The only scary part of this whole thing, besides my bank account being closed, was I now get random phone calls from phone numbers all over both international and the USA. I don't answer them, and I block them. A hard and scary lesson learned. Thank you for allowing me to share my one and only online dating experience. And we'd like to thank her for sharing her story. If you have a story you'd like to share, you can find us on Facebook under Scamming Scammers Action, as well as scammingscammers at gmail.com. If you'd like our story to be told, you can email it to us and just give us permission to narrate your story and we'll put it on a future video. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.